Welcome to episode 226 of the official Game Stitch podcast. I'm Ryan Walton. Today I'm joined by Matt Belden. Thanks for having me. And Dan is at a uh, Mother's Day brunch this morning. Yeah. Happy so Mother's Day to all the moms. Yeah, happy Mom's Day out there. Um, he'll be back next week, but obviously with something like that, we want him to, to uh, take care of his his uh, duties. Duties. His, his, his son duties. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, those son duties? Yeah, I guess so. You're making it sound <laughs> weird. <laughs> no, your son duties. Everybody's got duties, and you want to take care of them. Yeah, I get that. That's fine. Uh, uh, hmm. Now we're recording on Mother's Day. <clears throat> right. When you listen and we say Happy Mother's Day, it won't make any sense. You don't think they'll put two and two together? I think they assume that we just recorded it always. <laughs> right. Like it's, maybe it was right then, right before. That'd be cool if that's, that is how we did it. I mean, there's no room for error, and we're not the kind of operation that can go error-free. Yeah, that's true. Very apparent by my mix on the podcast the past two weeks. Do you want to talk about that? I, I, I'll give an explanation. I don't think it's necessary. Um, <laughs> so uh, what ha- I, can, I can tell you very specifically what happened this past week is – in the in the mix for the podcast when I receive all the audio from everybody I have a session that's uh, it's like a template so I don't have to f- like fuck with anything too much um, I, I did all the mixing a long time ago on the intro music and the outro music and uh, all I do is plug the audio in edit it down and go but I keep the uh, I keep things grouped together so that they they don't so if there's a splice in them they don't get you know separated and i have to remix it basically somehow i had the intro music tied to the outro music and when i plugged in all the audio from last week and edited it down i lined the intro music up where it's supposed to go i said cool that's good let me go get the outro music lined up and scooted that guy over to the end not realizing that the intro was tethered to it and so the intro moved with the outro about 20 seconds into the middle of the episode so right yeah so i had to, it, you know we fixed it I wondered also how you did that, and when you told me, I'm like, well, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, pretty, just, it's just, you know, operator error on my part for not noticing that they were grouped. It was my fault. And, but, and then when I, when I upload the podcast everywhere, I was, I had so much faith in Matt that I didn't bother to listen to it, because <laughs> I just knew it was right. Right. And so, it was actually a failure on two parts, but I think, I think we learned a valuable lesson. Yeah, what's that? And that <laughs> one of us should listen to it after we finish it <laughs> to make sure that it's all good. Yeah, probably. I used to always listen, but they were always fine, so. Right, so you just stop listening. You take it for yeah. granted. You're right. I just tell, like I said, too much faith. Right. I get that. You, I like mean, I'm, I understand, though. You think, hey, the guy that's got a bachelor's degree in audio production, probably not fucking up the audio uh, this week. I mean, like two, like 100 episodes <laughs> that I've listened to, they're all fine, so why wouldn't this one be? Right. So. I mean, I have the same kind of cockiness about it. I'm like, hey, bachelor's degree, don't need to listen. It's all good. So Now, one thing I do want to clarify is that when I listen, I just listen to the beginning. I've never listened to a full episode of our podcast. That's embarrassing. It's a it's a pretty good podcast. It's so I live it live though. <laughs> right. And I don't want to taint my memory of it. Now the strange part is when someone says, Hey, I love that part when you talk about that one thing. And I can't figure out what they're talking about mm-hmm. because I don't remember having that part of the conversation. Right. Because after 226 of these, they all start to kind of just blur together. It's oddly specific that after 226. Yeah. Well, and so what happens, though, is is the conversations that occur during the week. Mm-hmm. I can't yeah. remember what was on the podcast, what we just talked about, what we talked about before the podcast. That's true. And part part of the problem there is you and I continue topics long after the show and we've started right. them long before the show. Right. I, I've said to someone before, just listen to the last episode. We talk about it. And he get, and he said, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm like, well, maybe the one before that. And he was like, nope. Right. You're like, I okay, must... maybe we didn't talk about it. I don't know. Yeah. Because I did at some point. I've asked that question many times. Of like, hey, did we talk about this on the phone or did we talk about this on the show? Yeah, I don't know. I kind of like the mystery of not knowing what actually happened. 
I think that's fun. <clears throat> yeah, I guess there's, so. a, there's there's 225 episodes that I'm not really sure what happened. No, I can I can tell you right now. I don't remember specifically what we've ever talked about, but I've listened to almost every episode. Yeah, Dan <clears throat> listens uh, religiously. Mm-hmm. Dan is a big fan of this podcast. <laughs> Biggest fan, I think, probably. Yeah, he loves it. Um, and and you guys are awesome about letting us know when there is any kind of an issue, uh, which we do appreciate. But yeah, I've never listened to, and I never plan on listening to a full episode. It's embarrassing. I think uh, I think one week I was out. You and Dan did an episode. Mm-hmm. The only episode you've ever missed, I think. I started. Yeah, I started to listen. I started to listen to it, and I was like, "This filth doesn't have me on it," <laughs> and I cut it off. Uh, I made it probably fifteen <laughs> minutes into it, and it was and it was a great show. It, it just was wrong, right? I'm supposed to be there, so I had to shut it down. You are the anchor. It's a uh... pause, delete. <clears throat> wow! Never Jesus. thought about it again. Yep, moved on. Wow, wow, yeah. I do uh I do download the podcast every single week to Just, ensure that it's where it's supposed to be on iTunes. <laughs> to fluff those numbers. Well, I mean we don't we don't see much reporting data from iTunes anyways, they're pretty skimpy with, with what they'll share. Yeah. By skimpy I mean nothing. They don't share a single thing. Right. Um but I do it just to ensure that there is a download actually there. Right. <clears throat> so when I wake up Monday morning I see the time and that it downloaded and it's the full file and I'll delete that sucker. Right. Once I know it's good. What I should do is go ahead and give it a little play, apparently. Just put it on in the background. Listen to it. I can't stand to listen to myself. Gotcha. It's, I can't, to- can't tolerate it. About 30 minutes in, you'll you'll get over that, and it's really easy to listen to all the episodes. It's, some I, of it's good, man. Cause, okay, so to your point of like, like you don't really remember what we talk about, I don't remember what we've discussed in the moment, so I like to listen to the show to see if I said something stupid, which it, uh, often is the case. Well, I'm sure it is for me too, but I like thinking I never have. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like fact checking yourself. You can be like, "Oh man, that's wrong," or um, "Nailed that prediction." I like to I like to find out about that stuff, or I like to listen back and uh, make sure that we don't go over the same shit twice if we have a a conversation that you know keeps coming up in the shows. That um, happens sometimes, but on a whole, I'm really proud of the fact that we haven't covered too many of the same things. Yeah. Considering there, up until our friend Gerald got us together, there was almost no record keeping. <laughs> so it was a total shot in the dark in what we might talk about or the topics we pick or the Gone But Not Forgotten or even the titles of the show. Yeah. The fact that we've never repeated a Gone But Not Forgotten and never repeated a title for the show, is it still blows my mind. Without tracking. Yeah. And and it's easy enough that I could scroll back through 126 or 125 and look for the titles, but I don't do that. I just pick a new title, <laughs> and I go. Oh, goodness. Now, also, before we get into the show, I want to give a shout-out to um, Dan's wife, Nicole. Mm-hmm. Because we told a story about her last week. Was it last week? It would. It might have been a week before last because I don't remember this. Maybe I do, but I don't feel like I don't. I don't. You probably weren't. The episode I named. So there was a mouse loose in the house. She's deathly afraid of mice. I missed that one. I named the episode "Mouse in the Mouse house. in the House." Yep. What I didn't think about is that maybe she wouldn't want that story told. Oh. Which not typically not a problem. Doesn't listen to the podcast. Right. She listen to that one. Except for some people said, hey, you, they talk about you on the podcast, and she saw the episode and was like, hey, Dan, did you talk about me? And he's like, maybe I do a lot. Right. So I wanted to give a shout out to her for being such a good sport, because she's been on more episodes than maybe she knows. <laughs> and uh, especially the mouse story, because it was a great story. Um, and I actually think that she she came out looking better than Dan in that story. Mm-hmm. Because she's deathly afraid of them, so her part would be to be afraid of them. So I didn't. So I didn't hear the story. What happened? I didn't listen I to that did, episode. I went on it. I mean, more or less, uh, they 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 found a mouse, and Dan wasn't sure how to transport the mouse from inside the house to outside the house. Uh huh. 
in a so body went, bag. That's how. <laughs> so he went at it with a broom and was scraping it across the floor to knock it outside. And as he got to the door, the dog scooped it up. Oh, shit. <laughs> Ran over to her bed, flung it, and then they they have not since located the mouse. Oh, they'll find it soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like two weeks. This thing is free in their house. Oh, it didn't die? No. Oh. It scurried off. As hey, mice do. Maybe he learned his lesson and went back outside. I don't Brilliant. know. Brilliant. That damn dog that's always barking. So the dog is what indicated there was the mouse. It was trying to get like under the entertainment center, and that's when they saw it. Yeah. So Dan's immediate reaction, as Nicole screams for him to do something, was to throw his two cats at it. That's not so a he, bad idea. Like, So he scooped up a cat in each arm, and he tossed them like a superhero at it. And they just ran away because they don't and like being tossed. they ran away. Yeah. Because they didn't know what what the hell was happening. Yeah. They might have been more scared than the mouse at this point. Jesus. I like this story. I should have listened to this show. It would have been good. Yeah, you should have. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to say thank you for being a good sport about Dan telling stories about you on here, with or without your permission. <laughs> for sure. Um, because it was a good story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I never thought... That she would listen because he's made it clear that she doesn't listen. It was the mouse in the house that we could blame. That's a good title, and uh, it was too spot on. I should have done something more like Mickey's Big Adventure. Yeah. So you wouldn't have been thinking about it, but I didn't want Disney to sue us. I think I'm more surprised that they have mutual friends that listen to our show that would then report back to her. <laughs> I don't know how it happened. He said somebody. He said somebody was a whistleblower though piece of shit but thanks for listening whistleblower all <laughs> right i don't want to i don't want to offend said nart because i love each and every one of our listeners right so big news in our house we bought a second ps4 this week Ooh, you're right that's a gotta... ps4 too Living living on the top tippy top of the social so, socioeconomic mountain, top one uh, percent right there. We got, we got a living room PS4 now because uh, the the Nate Drake bundle was on sale at Target for like two sixty two thirty two thirty, and so no, we, have, and it came with a free copy of Ratchet and Clank, so we scooped it up. I think you'll do better than than I did with this, but I have only played my old PS4 one time since I got my new one. Mm, yeah, well, so Ricky has turned out to be quite the gamer. She's She's been playing Switch all morning, actually. Um, she gets real pissed that I take it to work because she wants to play it all the time. Uh, so, But she also loves the PS4, and it's really awesome that she's becoming interested in my hobbies because I will never become interested in hers. Uh, what if you bought another Switch? It's been discussed. <laughs> It hasn't been I mean, discussed. It seems like that's the easiest way. If you, if you are compelled to take yours to work, and she'd still like to play it, right? So, the reason for the other PS4 is partly because the PS3 doesn't do a great job of, of um, like wireless network connectivity mm-hmm. for certain things that we watch. So, if we're watching um, like the WWE Network, for instance, it, it the wireless adapter on the PlayStation is not fast enough to receive the content without skipping. Um, And I don't know. It's just the idea that we could, like, when we have friends over, we can take it into the living room instead of having to come to the studio. Because this is kind of my space, and I don't want, like, eight people in here. Um, So we did that, and uh, we got an extra copy of Ratchet & Clank, an extra copy of Uncharted. So um, I'm trying to decide if we're going to sell those back as trading credit to something or give them away on the show. So, uh, and it's Uncharted 4 that we would be giving away or selling back and the Ratchet & Clank remake. You um, had the Ratchet & Clank already? Yeah, we had it already. That's a great game. It's a fantastic game. It's one of Both the best great games. One of the best platformers I've played in a very long time yeah. and it was that throwback to the shit that I loved in the PS2 era, you know, it felt like Ratchet and Clank. It felt like Sly Cooper. It's and, and I think maybe we've never made this clear before. It's not just a HD. It is a, a remake. Yeah, it's so if I don't know if we've talked about this before or not, but that Ratchet and Clank game, it's like nineteen bucks anywhere. Um, but what it is is it takes the the series 
and you're like you're playing through the first game as if it were a retelling by another right. person or if it were like a movie made by like like imagine that the first game actually happened and then this one is imagine if they made a movie about that event yeah it's really it's, cool it's so much more impressive than just an hd version and i think i don't know if we've ever even talked about the game or not but um i don't want that to be lost to anybody that's listening if you have played or have not played ratchet and clank you should go spend the 20 dollars on that game yeah especially if you if you grew up in that ps2 era of ratchet and clank and those kind of games sly cooper um or if you loved you know banjo and kazooie um way back in the day like if you like that style of classic platformer break everything collect everything game it's spot on it probably does it better than almost anything else i'll tell um, you what i can't stop looking at it's ukulele I heard that's not that great. I've heard that too. But when mm-hmm. I watch a video for it, it looks like what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I've heard that it gets real close, but it just doesn't kill it. Hmm. It looks real good. Uh, when I say it looks good, I mean it looks like that style of game is supposed to look in my head. Yeah. You know, it's not. you're not going to set it side by side with, you know, Uncharted 4 and be like, oh, this, is, this holds up. But it looks like <laughs> it looks like a rare platformer, you know. I, uh, ukulele doesn't interest me, but the closer we get to the Crash Bandicoot HD stuff, the, uh, what's the title on that? The Insane Trilogy. Yeah, I get really excited about in. that. I'm real checked out on that. Um, and I, I love the first Crash, but I'll tell you, Uncharted 4 is the reason I think I don't need Crash, because I didn't like that. Um... I have a fond memory of Crash, but yeah, I guess like it. I can't imagine that style translates well after all the advancements that video games have made. But it's Crash, so I get I get that, and and I'm a big nostalgia guy. But I'm like uh, that. This wasn't fun. I would just be buying it to buy it. Not that I haven't done that in the past, right? But this is not going to be something that's hard to come by. It's not going to be a collector's item that's later true. on. Yeah. You know, if they did a collector's edition, maybe there's some value there. I just don't think I want to play that game. And I'm happy for everybody that does, and I know people have screamed for Crash, and it means that maybe we could see a new Crash, but just that one in Uncharted 4, that little snippet that you play, just feels so bad. Yeah. Or it did to me, at least, and not like something I want to pour hours back into. (laughs) Who knows, though? I've been known to change my mind. Yeah, yeah. The old flip-flopper. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say regularly, but I've I've changed. Yeah, I mean, I think you're allowed to. <clears throat> so you remember a couple of weeks where we had to send our switch controllers back to get the left one fixed? Yeah, I do remember it. that. So I don't know if you've bought any Joy Cons since then, but I bought those two that neon blue pack. Um, right. We were, you know, we we're at work. You're like, hey, Best Buy's got them. Popped on them immediately. My left Joy Con doesn't work. It's having desync issues. I need to send it back to Nintendo. I'm wildly curious if I'm able to, though, because to send the, the ones from the console back, we had to use the serial number from the console. These The controllers, when you buy them out by themselves, they don't have a serial number on them. Yeah, I wonder about that. And I don't know. I mean, surely you can send it back. Mm. Just tell them. Mm. There's no way they're not going to not let you send it back. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't imagine that. So I, my thought was with the Joy-Con desync issue happening, and the shortage of Joy Cons available, that they were like fixing them. They were like they were yeah, making sure that this didn't happen. Yeah, and then they all came out in a blast one day, and now they've still got the same problem. So I'm uh, super curious about that. I'll have to report back on that next week. Is the one that you got fixed is it good now? Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. mine too. Um, I put the uh, against Nintendo's best wishes i put the console back behind the television like a dream insist on that i don't know why you insist on it being behind the tv i think it's fun to like take the you take the tablet and you like you look at everybody you're like watch this and you put it behind the tv like a magic trick you know and then you come back out and it's on the tv like it just in my brain that's really cool i'm real proud it's out of the way mine's up up front on the mantle and i'm real proud of it yeah um i like it displayed like that I don't want mine somewhere where the cat can come by and knock her off. Yeah. So, and I, well, I'm really weird is that I don't leave mine in the charging dock. Mm. When I think it's at 100%, I take it out and put it in its case. Well, you don't have to think. It'll tell you it's at 
Well, yeah, but I'm not always staring at it. I guess. I guess. So when I feel like it's it's been up and uh, like long enough, I pull it out, and then when the screen pops on, tells me what it's at. If it's 95 or above, it goes right in the case. Mine spends all night in the dock, and then I put it in the case on the way to work. No, see, mine does. Mine has stayed twice since I've had it all night long. You scared somebody's gonna get it? I just don't want to leave it in the dock. Doesn't need to be. I mean, that's what it, that's what it's for, though. The dock it's, is its home. Doesn't need it. Doesn't need it. No, its home is the case that I bought for it. It's <laughs> lovingly protected. Uh, I also, uh, I also don't leave the pro controllers charging overnight. Oh man, what the hell? Once they're full charged, I unplug. Uh, so I did not get a new Joy-Con. I got a, another Pro Controller mm-hmm. because the Pro Controllers are steady. They're, they feel good. They They're work great. well. And uh, that gives me three complete controllers because you could use the Joy-Con to make a third or the ability to play with four players if you split the Joy-Con up. That's more than enough. Um, and I'm I'm happy with the Pro Controller choice. Now, they're expensive. They are. Um, I'd like to have a little Pro Controller appreciation moment, though. Because they are DualShock 3 sized, Xbox stick layout, the buttons are gigantic, which feel great to play. They're like hoary yeah. sized buttons. Yeah, they're like, jitterbug buttons for sure. Yeah. The only problem I have with it is the triggers are not analog, they're just button press. Mm-hmm. Um, but And the thing feels like it weighs like, like you know, a couple of pounds. Easily the heaviest controller on the market for first yeah. party. It's, oh, it's yeah. A, you feel... Like that controller was made for what it costs. Yeah. Like it feels like a eighty dollar controller or seventy dollar controller. I guess it is. Like it's heavy. It's girthy. It feels good. The plastic doesn't feel cheap. I don't know why it's so heavy. Yeah. Nintendo um, is killing it with the peripherals on this console. The controllers in particular. I I thought the Joy Cons at at ninety dollars were too much. Or at eighty dollars, seventy nine ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was too much, but dude, I love them. I love yeah. them. Like all, all four of them, they feel great. Um, and the pro controller, I tried to hold off on, and they, you know, they were. It was just on the shelf that one day, and I had to get it because you wouldn't stop talking about it. And it's, it's so easily, good. easily one of the best controllers ever made. It's not. I think Xbox One still has the best controller of the past decade. But the Pro Controller is a tight second to that. It's it's very close. If it had those triggers that the Xbox One has, it would be awesome. I'll tell you, I was like, the only thing I don't like about this is it's going to be hard for me to still do the Amiibo stuff as I'm playing. <clears throat> and then it- when I turned the game on, it's like, just tap the Amiibo on the Pro Controller. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. You don't even have to find the tablet. I just tap it and it's good to go. It's got that Amiibo support built into the center of the Pro Controller, which makes it really easy to to use. Gotcha. Um, so I don't have to hunt around. I don't have to do anything. I don't, you know, it's in the right Joy-Con. It's in the uh, Pro Controller. <clears throat> you know, you can use the Amiibo any way you want, but it's really convenient when you go tabletop or when you're playing on the TV to just grab the Amiibo and tap them right on the controller. This may not be the right platform to discuss this, but I have been thinking about grabbing the NFC stickers and figuring out how to generate my own amiibo. Right. And so uh, and here's here's the reason. Um uh, I'm late to the Nintendo game. I haven't I haven't played Nintendo since GameCube. Um and amiibos are something I missed out on and if there is an amiibo that I want, 9 times out of 10 the damn thing costs $120 and you can't find it anyway if you wanted it. Um, yeah, Ninten- I don't Nintendo doesn't give you an option for that otherwise. I don't promote piracy. But I will say that if you wanted something for Zelda, you could not find it right now. Yeah. And, and that's not it's, fair. It's not that I don't want to give Nintendo my money. They you just, can't. Yeah, like they won't let me. <laughs> like, right. Like Nintendo, I would like to give you this $100 so I can have all of these things for, for this game. But Nintendo's like, fuck it, keep your 100 bucks. Like, okay. May, yeah. may, maybe this is the other option. I, and I really hate to say that because Nintendo could make so much... It, it, even if they did... A playing card for just five dollars, no matter what. You get a playing card; it's whatever amiibo you wanted. You just don't get the statue with it. I'd buy that, and they don't yeah, make they, it an option. They don't care that you want to buy it. There, there are a ton of people who are doing their own in NFC stuff, especially like on places like Etsy and eBay. And yeah, well, and I mean, 
when you buy an amiibo that's rare and then you it's twelve dollars, fifteen dollars off the shelf, and then you're selling it on eBay for one hundred and twenty dollars, like price gouging is like I get it, it's rare, but Nintendo shouldn't expect that people are going to purchase an overpriced amiibo either, you know. Right, and I, and I think Nintendo's expectation is that you don't spend two hundred dollars on it. So then that means their expectation is that you just don't have it. Right, and, and that's I, a little unacceptable. If they want to create rarity, that's fine. The problem is, is that these things give you something in game that you cannot access otherwise, and that to me that means that you can't play the complete game. Yeah, um, and it, it's something simple like just create a greatest hits version of those amiibo. Right. Leave the original as it is with a very you know short limited run, right. but then make them with a red base or something so people know that you got the second version. Yeah, yeah. Or just put out like in a in a deck of cards like all the Legend of Zelda amiibos and the, ele- the like the Legend of Z uh, of Zelda Master Pack, and it's it's just playing card size and it's all the Legend of Zelda amiibos that came out up until a certain point, but it's just the NFC card and the information on the character. Now, I love the, the idea of cards, especially for the Switch, you know, being portable, but I don't see Nintendo ever going to that. Mm-hmm. Um, not because they can't, because that's how the Animal Crossing cards work. They're cards. Yeah. Um, you slap them on the 3DS, and then bam, you're in it, you're, you're happy home designing. But with Zelda, with things like that, they know, you know, those, those pack of cards are $4 for a pack of five. Right. And they want to make $15 per figure. Right, but but they don't because they're not making the figures. Yeah, it's weird. I, yeah. I don't I don't understand anything like that. I don't like, understand why you would short something that you know. Like they don't want all the amiibo. Animal Crossing ones are everywhere, and they're you can get them for like five bucks. Yeah. Um, but people, every time I'm in a Best Buy, there's someone looking for Zelda amiibo. Yeah, I mean every time it doesn't have to be anything crazy, but yeah, even if it's a second print amiibo that's six dollars or twelve dollars. And there's something about it that makes it, you know, like it's a solid color all the way up. Like it's just red from the base to the top. Like it's not painted or anything like that. Like make it worthless, but give me the ability to give you the money for that thing. You know, that's weird. I don't, weird I don't understand a lot of things. There's there's a store in town. This has nothing to do with video games, but the fidget spinners are popular right now. Oh man, they're, they're like vaping. Fidget yeah, spinners the, and vaping. Good man. If I could find a fidget spinner store, I'd be in that thing. Anyways, there's a store in town. They have an ad, limit two per customer. Why the fuck do you care? Right. If somebody wants to come in and buy the whole fucking store out, are you going to tell just them they can't? Just sell can? them. Yeah. yeah. Just sell them. I don't understand. Why does it matter who buys them? Right. Right. Is unless, it, like, unless they're worried about what we're talking about, people are buying them and reselling them on you know Craigslist or where, whatever people use locally, like Lego... You yeah, know, maybe but, that's the issue, and they want to make sure people can, unlike Nintendo, just go buy them. But I'm thinking you should be able to mass produce these things. Yeah, well, I mean, here's so if I'm a retail location, here's my thought: is hey, I bought in a thousand dollars worth of merchandise. I stand to make two thousand dollars on it. If one person comes in and says, "I will buy all of those things," and I've made my two thousand dollars back in twenty five seconds, that's a lot better than having to wait a month to sell out of it. But that's what's created the drought in amiibo someone walks in buys everything there and then goes and puts them on ebay right but i mean that's nintendo's fault for not producing them in a manner that allows them to be available yeah i wonder about the production of amiibo it must be really complicated i don't think so i don't think so because the the nfc tags are like 15 cents a piece you buy them in bulk we know the nfc is not the complicated part I mean, you can literally buy a sticker and just... Yeah, I mean, you can do it on your phone in 25 yeah, seconds. Pretty easy. So so the production of the statue itself, the figure, it has to be what, what is holding them up. They act like they can only make one thing at a time. Yeah. Like we're running Mario's right now, so we can't run Zelda's. Yeah. Man, and you know what? Like, it's been easy to slam Nintendo in the past. It's hard to talk shit about them now because the Switch is so goddamn good. Mm-hmm. That I'm in love with them. I've got I've got those like lovey goggles on for Nintendo, and it's hard to call them stupid. But it, once again, it's, it's does it stupidity on their part. Like 
maybe they only produce their things for the Japanese market. Like maybe that that's that's what it is. Like maybe that stuff's readily available over here. We are a secondary market for Nintendo. They don't gi- like they don't have to give a shit about us. But yeah, it's, it's weird. Just, I don't know. Yeah, it's just so odd. I don't know. They're real switchy about it. Yeah, you like that? Yeah, I got you. I missed the snap. It's been a long time since I heard it. <laughs> and it feels good. If this is your first time joining us, hello. How are you? You look nice today. Wow. I mean, I just want to, I want everybody to feel welcome. I got this you. is the official Game Stitch podcast. Usually it's three of us. We're best friends. We sit around, we talk about video games, we talk about news, nerd culture, all the things you love. We wrap it up in the bullshit you don't care about, like Amiibo. <laughs> amoeba. You're welcome. Amoeba. The Amiibosis. Um, once we uh, throw that all in a food processor, what we come out with is a dumpster fire that we present for you every week. Uh, Monday, 6 a.m. Central Standard Time on podcast services around the world. Uh, and we hope that you continue to listen. Uh, if you love the show, you can support us over at patreon.com forward slash game stitch. Toss us a couple bones on there if you have a couple bones to toss. If you don't, that's cool too. This show will always be free. Um, but we do ask that you tell your friends, your family, your loved ones, strangers, especially strangers, about this podcast. Mm-hmm. If you see somebody in a dark alley, you walk up to them, you say, The official Game Stitch <clears throat> podcast, Mondays at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time, podcast services worldwide, then you walk off. Yeah. Not another word. Right. And uh, that is that is helpful for us because the more people that find this podcast, the more people that listen, the more people that listen, the, well, the better, the better shows we can do, hopefully. Yeah. Bigger it's community, like a, for sure. Yeah, it's like a circle of life. A circle of life, COL, is, it's got a bad connotation now because of GameStop, it does, so <laughs> you may want to go away from that. It's like a, it's like a, okay, it's like a octagon of life. Okay, I got it. It's got eight uh, sides. Yeah, there are, eight, there are eight sides that we, uh, but one of those sides is that you tell people about this podcast. One of the other sides is that they listen and then they tell people. Right. So it's, I don't have the other sides right now. I don't want to call it a pyramid scheme, but maybe it's something shaped like a triangle. It's not a pyramid, but so there's legs underneath you. There's these <laughs> tiers, right? Tiers, yeah. And if you find someone to sell <laughs> under you, you get part of their money. Right. But not like a pyramid. Not and at definitely all. not a scheme. Right. <laughs> I love people who are involved in pyramid schemes. If you are involved in one, uh, let us know. Podcast, uh, Game Stitch <laughs> Podcast, podcast at GameStitch.com, whatever it is, let us know there. Uh, I assume we won't get any emails because people who are a part of uh, pyramid schemes don't know it. I just want, I need the justification every time. They never know they're part of it. They're like, what I have to do is I have to spend five hundred dollars. I'm going to buy in the product, but then right. by the time I sell it back, I've made five thousand dollars. Like, tell me again, tell me again. <laughs> and and I want to be clear. And this is a public service announcement. If you know anyone that sells anything, and they come to you and they don't want you to buy it, but they want you to then sell it also. Yeah, it's a pyramid scheme. Yep. And that's okay as long as you know. I don't want people out there not knowing they're part of the scheme, though. Yeah. Now, as long as you know and you're down with it, then I say all aboard, because people can make pretty good money at it. There are two that I will advocate. One is Mary Kay. Mary Kay is the best pyramid scheme ever, but like I yeah. can't help but you see the people like driving around in the Land Rover, the Mary Kay edition. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, okay, like that That one works. Um, <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> also, like the different, uh, the different makeup things that do like Facebook parties. Yeah. Where like you don't buy anything. You just host an advertisement on Facebook for them and tell people how great it is and whatever they buy, they use your affiliate number. Like that's cool because you didn't buy anything. You just get some money for it. It's it's not much different than what we do on here when we ask you to, to go over to uh audibletrial.com forward slash game stitch. That's right. pretty much the same thing. Or use our Amazon affiliate link. Right. You go like there, that, yeah. you buy something, we get a cut of it. It works the same way. There's the the term pyramid scheme is really disgusting, um, and they don't call it that. They they call it like tiered marketing or something like that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when I lived in Seattle, I was I was prompted with a pyramid scheme. I just want people to know they're a part of one, and then I say, <laughs> if you know, rock it out. I know people who make a lot of money on things like this. Yeah, a lot of money, like the money that they promise you when they try to get you to do it. Yeah. I also know people who don't make any money off of it, who buy $500 worth of product every month, uh, 
Just so they can t- continue to not sell it. Right, because they want the thing. Yeah, because they get the stuff. That's like, mine's free. I'm like, it's not. You're spending $500. No, mine's free, though. Yeah. Listen, bro. That's just my investment. Right. I invest in the company, and they invest in me. Like, nope. <laughs> I had a friend who was severely brainwashed, uh, and what he told me was, if I just tried harder, though, I could make my money back. Like, at some point, he believed in it so much that he was blaming himself. That's crazy. And I was like, man, hats off to your handler. <laughs> because right? cause they got you all in. Um, and if you, like I said, if you're a part of one, write in, let us know, because I don't think they're a bad thing. I just want people to know they're a part of one. Right. If you're doing it right I, and making money, let us know. Maybe that's support, what we should do. <laughs> I support pyramid schemes and, and the idea of someone else doing them. Right. Like, I think they should exist. Like, look how long Mary Kay has been around. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it's safe to say that both of us are pretty okay with the way capitalism works. Yeah. Like, make your money, dude. Yeah. I just want to, I want that to be clear. The takeaway from this is that we're, we're fine with it. We just, we want to know more. Yeah. Maybe um, because we're not, interested. <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, if you, if you want to pitch me a pyramid scheme, I would love to hear it. I, what about the official Game Stitch pyramid scheme? It's not bad. It could be I the mean, next thing that we do. Right, because it's not about us making money. It's about you making money. Yeah. All we, you have to do is sell the product, and everybody that you get to sell the product, you get a cut of theirs. There's branches like a tree. All right, picture a tree. <laughs> and each time the branch splits off from you. It goes up towards you, the sun. You get their money, though, right. each time it splits off from your branch. Right, it goes up. Mm-hmm. So it's not at all like a pyramid. It's like a and tree. then when someone says, but I have to pay you, though, and you're like, yeah, but that's just how it, but all your branches will be covering all that. Right. You invest in us, and then we invest in you. Right. Yeah. With a fine product. Yeah. Uh, it sells itself. <laughs> but we need you to sell it. <laughs> and everybody you know. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you, let me just, let me take it a step further if you have a pyramid scheme that you're a part of or multi-tiered marketing um and you write into us i will figure out a way to get your sales pitch on on audio version so we can insert it in this podcast because i love a good sales wow. pitch for a pyramid scheme the last wow. one i had was for some nutrition stuff no i've done that i yeah. like it i like to hear about it i'm yeah. not interested i had a guy so when i was in seattle i worked at guitar center and this guy was like hey man I'm really interested in this guitar, and like we we start going in this guitar, and like halfway through, I realize he's pitching me on his pyramid scheme. He's like, "Yeah, man, I make like sixty grand a year." I'm like, "Oh, that's cool." So you want this four thousand dollar guitar? He's like, "Yeah, dude, I just sell nutrition supplements. I just go to the gym with my bag. I just sell this stuff." I'm like, "That's cool." So this guitar, he's like, "Yeah, man. Hey, can I take you out to coffee?" I'm like, "Yeah, I like coffee. Let's go. Are you gonna buy this guitar?" We go out to coffee. I start pitching the guitar. This dude pu- pulls up a duffel bag and just starts like laying bars and like like pre-workout and like supplements and stuff all out in like a in in like a display and i'm like oh shit now let me ask you this though was what he was doing was that any different than what you were doing no and that's why i don't have a problem with it right you know i got my paycheck from selling guitars he gets his from selling whatever from slinging supplements i get it right where he where where he lost me was like, hey, so you can buy everything in this duffel bag. I'll actually give you this one right here to go sell for three hundred and fifty dollars. But all this stuff is worth eight hundred dollars. He said you can sell in a couple of days. And I'm like, Yeah, I don't have the three three fifty up front's where you get me. I've never right. ha- I've never had a job where I had to pay to work there. So Right. If you believe in me, give me the bag. Right. Right. So what I should do is go sell it and if it's three fifty it costs, you just take that out of what I sold it for. Right. Right, I'll give you the three fifty back. It's a lot like dealing drugs. I'm realizing right now. Yeah, when you well, this one now a lot of them don't sound as drug dealery as this one. <laughs> right. This one sounds like you're a pill pusher. Right. It's a lot like, hey, I'm gonna buy this weed from you for this much, but on the promise that I, you know, on the on the idea that at that point I can sell it back for whatever I want to and make my money back plus. But that is how it works. You pay for the weed up front. Right. Then you go make whatever you can, and you bring your profit back. And you buy more weed, and you keep mm-hmm. whatever cut you can of your money. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like the nutrition thing that you were almost a part of is exactly the same. It sounds like legally it's the same way the drug dealers work, but with, like, Heath bars and, like, nutrition supplements. It's just the pharmaceutical rep. Yeah. 
I mean, that's what they do. They go around, they're like, let me show you this duffel bag full of it, things that'll make your life better. If there'd have been a cop 20 feet away, we would have gotten, <laughs> we, we'd have been down. He pulls a black duffel bag from out, out from under the table at Starbucks and plops it on the counter. I'm like, oh no. You know what the move is when the police walk over though. You tell them about nutrition. You throw your hands up and you scoot back as far away as you can. No, no. You tell them about nutrition and you tell them for $350, this whole duffel bag could be his. He can sell to everybody in the station and he can easily earn $2,000 a month right. following these simple steps. You don't even have to quit being a cop. You can do it as a cop. Like, yeah. It's that And simple. all of your cop friends, they can do it too. And you earn off of each right. tier. Right. Because what they not do shaped like a pyramid. is they come to you to buy their duffel bag. Right. And you keep that money. You just Pretty reinvest. Soon, you won't even have to sell the product yourself because everyone underneath you will be selling it. Right. And just it's raking free in that money. cash. You're your own boss. It's free money. I guess if you don't like free money, you should get up and leave this fucking table right now. <laughs> <laughs> but if but if you like free cash, sit here and listen to me for a couple more minutes. I think maybe I should do pyramid schemes. Stuff. I think maybe we should. <laughs> I'm kind of into it. it the yeah. more we talk about it. Mm-hmm. I might shut the podcast down and do that. Instead. That initial investment gets me, but you know, if you think we can do it, so we pyramid scheme uh, fidget spinners. Oh my god, we do vape Facebook and, Vape and fidget spinners. <laughs> vape. <laughs> I walked by a store. I forget where I was at. Um, it might have been the mall here in town. There is a classy looking vape store. What's it called? Um, I can't remember. Pro Vapor. Oh maybe. man, that sounds classy. It's like. The whole front of it's glass, and they have like a really, like, it's almost like a bar set up in there. Mm-hmm. With like a high countertop that wraps around. But they have like lounge chairs for people just, like a cigar shop almost. Oh, that's cool. And it's like there's just people in there who are just like enjoying the fact that they vape. Like, they're not hot boxing it, but there are people in there vaping, and it looks like it's got really good ventilation, and it's, it's the walls are black. Yeah. But the whole front is glass. So it's got like a, almost like a like a smoke club vibe in there. Yeah, I mean, look, if you like vaping, that's fine, as long as you understand that it's stupid. Uh, but now, I also respect anybody that has a hobby that they are like invested in a hundred percent. Oh yeah, me too. Now, better or worse, vaping or pyramid scheme? Vaping is worse for sure. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, because. Other than the fact that you are littering the world with the smell of blueberry pancakes, and in that respect, you're a saint if you vape. Um, there's nothing like walking into what you think is a cloud of like cigarette smoke, and you're like, "God, this is gonna suck." And it turns out that it's like maple syrup and butter, uh-huh. and you're like, "All right, all right." Yeah. yeah, this this couple got a car in front of me the other day, and they rolled smoke. And it looked as if a car was overheating. Right. There was so much. And I got out of my car and I was thinking, damn it. And immediately overwhelmed by the smell of Fruit Loops. Whoa. Yeah. And I was like, all right, where did they go? I got hit with burnt <laughs> marshmallows out of left field the other day and That's spun not bad around either. to find it. And I couldn't see anybody vaping yeah. anywhere. No idea. If, if I could have found these this, this couple, this couple of vapors, I, I would have walked behind them all the way to my destination. Right. Because I like Fruit Loops. Right. The problem with vaping is the rig, uh, <laughs> how into the rig they get, and cloud chasers. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I've, like you said, though, like you're passionate about something. I believe if I if I vaped, I would be that guy right. who was constantly talking about my rig and my coals. Yeah. <laughs> and how tightly they're wound. Yeah. And, and you know, how many, how many drops I, I, I drip on the coils. Yeah. I think I would talk about that. They're like car people, but about, like, fake smoking. It's yeah, weird. They really are like car people. Like, they got car batteries in their backpacks so, they're, so their rig can run full blast because they're... Right. I got this cool... cloud chasers. This cool boat finish on mine, and... God. Mahogany. Mine's made out of wood. God damn, that's classy. Yeah, mahogany I don't know if I've with, ever seen a wood one, but now that I say that, maybe I'll do that. Like, wood with gold inlays. Got your initials yeah. in cursive on it. You know how they make the the boats out of wood? I, yeah, spend, I do now. They spend like years making those boats. Yeah, I'd like to do that with a vape, with a rig. <laughs> but I don't. It's like a tattoo artist that doesn't have any tattoos, though. Like mm-hmm. if you're not vaping yourself, I feel like selling rigs is weird. I think that's okay. Cause, you think so? Yeah, I think I think it's fine. You don't have to do it to understand it. Kinda, don't you though? No, I don't think so. With the, that one, a little bit, the, like 
Because, okay, so the process of vaping is not at all about the rig itself. Like, the the technical aspect, the mechanics of it, that's something different. It's like, if you, what you want to do is design a rig, like, you just have to understand how the machine works. And then you have to appeal to the to the vapist. Yeah, I guess if you're just making the machine. Now, if you're, yeah, but still you want to see how it comes out and how it feels. Now, and... if, you're, if you're making vape flavors... Then you I definitely think then have to you use... need to vape, right? Because then you need to understand, like, I yeah. Guess... But my thinking is, like, if you're a rig and they're like, "How does it feel?" and you're like, "I don't know." Yeah, but you can buy a, like a popular rig and you can go similar. Right? But don't I need? To, I mean, yeah, aesthetically or weight, but don't you want to feel how that how the vape feels coming out of it? No, I don't think you. Ha- I mean, maybe you do, but I don't think you have to. I don't know either. I don't. I don't even know what the 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 market's like in the custom vape rig shop. Like I don't even know what the market. Like, do I have to sell them out of a duffel bag? I don't know. Could I get a store? I don't know. When's the vape boom end? I thought it'd be gone by now. Yeah, I thought vaping would be over and done with as soon as people realized that it was kind of uh, like it's kind. Of, it's kind of like wearing Jinkos, you know, which was cool in like 1990 for about a it's, minute. It's still a little bit cool. Is it like having yes, the so. the bottoms of your jeans be like sixty inches? You remember that it was so absurd that some of them would like zip so that if you didn't want to always have them flared out, yeah, you could contain it. It was so weird that the bottom of your pants that surrounded your shoe was big enough to put your fattest friend in. Shout like out on to, each leg to Jeffrey Payton. Oh man, for having the best jinkos that made me jealous in middle school. I used to have the shoe hiders, man. His were black. But the in between, the flare had like the like a a black like swirly pattern inside of it. Oh, that's cool. Like like when you're being hypnotized. Yeah, it had that inside of his his jink. Yeah, I, and, I guess uh, I guess I didn't love my shoes the way that I do now. But when I was in in junior high and middle school, I wanted the, I wanted it to cover my shoes up. I didn't want anybody to know. Yeah, I had some like that, and they might have been even. Uh, they might have been. I, I know I had one pair of Jinko that I loved and I wore too often. Yeah. Um, but like even jeans you would get at normal stores had the flare. Yeah. The hard flare. I hate it because <laughs> so, there's something about growing up. I've gotten more and more like I want the bottoms of my jeans to be like behind the tongue of my shoes now. Oh, you're like a skinny jeans guy now. Yeah, not I'm not skinny jeans. I just don't need it. I don't want them to cover my shoes. I, I like my shoes. I, and, I just want them to cover the tongue and and rest on top of the lace Mm-mm, or where said lace would go that's too covered i, I want yeah. them on the back they need to be like above the foxing of the shoe and on the front they need to be behind the tongue they don't have to be tight no on the back i want them to to carry down to right before the sole because what i don't want is water on the back of my jeans i don't want the fray on the back of my jeans i like that shit up off the ground yeah i mean i, I usually don't get those things now i've got a pair that's too long yeah and they'll they're like a wick Right, I hate that. All they want is to suck up water off the ground. Yeah, I don't do that, man. I've started, uh, I've learned to pull my pants up and buy them at the right length. That's just. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, uh, I wear my jeans up where they go, and I always wear a belt. Mm-hmm. Um, always wear an undershirt. I like, I'm pretty particular with the way things are, but I've got one pair of gray slacks. They're just a touch too long. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the black shoes that I wear, the black dress shoes I wear to work, they have a thicker sole than the brown ones that I wear. Right. So when when I'm thinking about pants, if I try them on, if I try a pair that I know I'm going to wear with black shoes and they're a little too long, it's okay because I know I've got a thick-soled black shoe. Right. What I've done is lock myself into only ever having a thick-soled black shoe. Mm. When I replace this set of shoes that I'm using now, I have to get a thick sole because this this particular pair of pants was purchased under the illusion that I'd always have a thick thick-soled black shoe. Or I have to toss the pants too. Toss the pants. The pants are the kind like of money. Problem. The pants I don't have that kind of money. Problem. I'm not rich. I'm just trying to get by. Right. A lot of talking. We haven't talked about anything yet. <laughs> well, we talked about Switch for a little while. But and I'll we're... tell you, that was uh, act. Right. I think we're going to come back to Switch, though. Aren't we, we, are. we supposed to? Okay. Like all things we come back to. Right. Um, but I want to start. So. A couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago at this point, we teased a game we were playing that we couldn't talk about. Mm-hmm. Embargoes and all that. Embargoes. Full disclosure, this game was provided by NIS America. Um, our friends over there 
shot it over to us because they thought this is a game that we would love, and we thought this is a game we would love, and we wanted to uh, give it a shot. Uh, the embargo list it lifted last week. It, it was weird timing because of when we record. Right. Um, so we would have liked to have gotten this content to you a little sooner. Uh, we toyed with the idea of making a video for it. But this isn't a game talk, for that, yeah. Yeah, when we talk about the game a little more, I think you'll understand why we didn't, um, because it just doesn't fit it. So the game is Birthdays the Beginning. Uh, you're probably scratching your head right now going, what? We've talked about this game before, though. When this we game first was teased, we spoke about it, because we've, right. we've been invested in it immediately. If you go back, uh, there's a point where I think I said this game was made for someone like me. It is. Um, that's before we even knew we were getting a copy. It's, it's you know, far before all that. So I'll tell you, um, this game, let me, let me read what's on the back of the case for you. Or at least in the description that's listed online, because I didn't get a case. Uh, a garden game in which players create a cube-shaped world that gives rise to diverse and unique life forms. Shape the geography, alter the temperature of each world to create conditions for life, and birth an entire ecosystem. Yeah. Now, that probably doesn't sound good to you. But this game is made for people like me. Um, you start with a blank cube. And when I say a cube, I mean a cube. Mm -hmm. It's a gray, desolate cube. Yeah. You're this weird Knuckles avatar... <laughs> looks like Knuckles. Uh, looks like yep. Knuckles' third cousin by marriage. Yep. Um, it's a cube, and you basically have nothing. And from that, you create a, an ecosystem. And as in the real world, as the ecosystem flourishes and temperatures change and and geographies change, then the ecosystem adapts and new new creatures are born from it. And. Uh, so this game is it's made by Toy Box Inc. developed by them. Uh, their first game. Now half of that team is uh, he is the creator of the Harvest Moon series. Right. That's how I got turned on to this game. I was searching for Harvest Moon stuff at some point, and I found something that was like, "Hey, Harvest Moon creators, new venture," and uh, that's how I ended up finding this game. But it has that vibe. Would you agree? Yeah. You played this game also. Yeah, um, so in my time with this game, it um, to to me it doesn't feel exactly like anything that Yasuhiro Wada has ever done before, um, but it's definitely one of those games that he's had at, like you can tell it came from him because of how much the game doesn't give you. Like very much like Harvest Moon, the game doesn't give you anything. It says here are the tools, here's maybe a goal, but it's kind of up to you to get there. Um, and I think that's that speaks to a lot to why we didn't do a review video and why it's just easier to talk about this game. Um, if you if if I were to show you my gameplay and Ryan were to show you his gameplay, um, we we may have gotten to the same place but completely different. And mm -hmm. you may have had different life forms develop based on the conditions of yours, and I may have had different life forms based on mine. But show, I think showing that takes away what the game is really about, which is the discovery. It's not so much about the goals and the unlocks. It's really about the like taking a ball of clay and just playing with it. Um, it initially, what I thought I was getting into was something like Minecraft with mm -hmm. the the cube style world. Um, but very quickly, it was it was obvious that it was something different. Um, it's got a little bit of a resource manager vibe without having to manage resources. Um, and it's got a little bit of a no man's sky vibe without, and by that I mean like your world will evolve a life form and then you have to like search around your world to find it. And then you put it into a catalog and you can see like the hierarchy of like how that evolved and what it could evolve into and stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else I really want to say about this game other than it's very easy to get lost in it. It's very fun, um, and the price is right on it if you think that this kind of game suits you. like 100% go buy it if, if you're at all interested in games like Harvest Moon, Stardew Valley. Um, if, you, if you like that 
that open ended um like the the game is about the game play and not about the end goal. Yeah, it's it's, it's very strange in the way that it's laid out. So I will tell you, when you start the game, there are a lot of direction that, that is given, and none of it makes any sense to you. Yeah. Um, Knuckles talks a lot. Um, and then after that, you're kind of like just tossed into this world. Hey, create a, create a, a, a world. Uh, but part of, like what you were saying, to speak to that, they're, they're, your catalog is totally black when you start. Right. You can see the outline of, of what some animals are, what some you know, fish, organisms, all kinds of different stuff, plants. And you don't know what any of it is or how to get to it. And the reason we decided to not do that video is because there are times yeah. where something new would evolve. And I was like, right. hell yeah. This is what I've been waiting. I didn't even know I was waiting for this, but I've been waiting for this. And you go through the different periods and you see things that are familiar. You see things you've never seen. You're like, this is badass. And, um, the game has a yeah. Dragon Quest vibe in that all things that were important before stop being important as you advance. So if, if getting, let's say, this fish was all you cared about was getting this fish, and you get it and you realize the next step to get to where you want to go after that fish will actually kill that fish. Right. Like, that fish needs to go extinct because it eats the same food as this other thing that you're trying to make. It eats the same food, or the water has to get hotter to birth this thing that you want, and it can actually survive in. And 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 what happens is you actually send your your ecosystem into these different times, um, and that happens because of the climate. And so so you you shape the land, and and like Matt said, I also thought this was going to yeah. be a Minecraft thing. Uh, so I jump in, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to build the prettiest world ever. What I did was murder everything on my map. Uh, once you get it going, and I was like, now that I have some resources, I want to really flush this map out, and I want to make the make it look the way I want. Yeah. What I what I didn't care about and took no account for was the temperature. Yeah. I creating the perfect map. I spun my map into the ice age, but I had not evolved enough for anything to exist. Yeah. So I had a snow-covered map with n one plant still alive. But the cool thing about the game is is, is because there's no definite end, at least in, in the 10 right. or 12 hours I've played, is I was able to reverse that by changing the map. Right. Um, lowering some of the mountains I had, adding more water in, changing the depth of the water I did have. And so I basically had to, five hours into this game, start all the way over without starting over by just creating a map that would foster some of these animals that I needed. And it, it's a, uh, it, it's truly unique. Um, you make the changes, but, but the world happens on its own. So once you've designed it the way you want it and you have things set and you like the temperature and you like where you have moisture and all that crap, you, you just start it and you let it run and things happen. It, it's a, an example or it's a, I guess it's like a, it's a hands-on demonstration of how, evolution and life work which is probably the coolest part about it in that it, like if you don't understand how an or like how mm -hmm. plankton started in the ocean and that became this that and the other and how different how that branched off into different life forms and how eventually they, that came to dinosaurs like the game does that but it's up to you as to what speed and how successful you are at it um it's also really cool for like plants to see how like the first time that a fern popped up, I lost my goddamn mind. And then as you raise or lower the temperature, like that fern becomes this type of fern or this type of fern and that 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 mother fern might like might die. But that means that the other ones become the like your point of of creating the next thing and I kind of did the same thing that you did Ryan, but I did it the opposite way. I uh I wanted to build like waterfalls and like lagoons and stuff like that. And that's really cool, but it doesn't give way to mm -hmm. any other kind of, like it really stunted the life on the planet. So instead, like I didn't kill everything off, but I also got to the point where like nothing new would evolve because there wasn't enough change happening in the world. It, it's, and that's the crazy thing about the game is, is if I played it and you played it and Dan played it and, 
you know, ten people in a row played it, it would be a different game for all of us. The, they give you the tools and the presentation is the same, but the experience of like getting from point A to point B is different for everybody. And it, it doesn't let you rest on, you know, there was there was a time where I kind of the same thing where once I rebounded, got life back, and I got a pretty cool setup. I'm like, this is awesome. And my numbers, because you watch the numbers go up or down based off the environment that you've created, my number for five or ten things were skyrocketing. 300,000, 400,000, 500,000. I didn't need those things to move to the next level, and I couldn't sustain those things in that amount because the things that those things eat were not, they weren't multiplying at that volume. The, the game is so cool when it comes to that. If you have a, a child that's between 8 and 12 years old and you set them down and let them watch you play this game, they will probably piss them their pants. Uh, I would have as a small child, like to see the way evolution works in a like whimsical, fun video game way. Uh, even as an adult, and this this feels very nostalgic, even though it's it's not really. Um, it it just there's something cool about going through those different periods that you know about that you've learned about, and seeing oh that's how we got here. Like that, right? Which I'll tell you, like, everything in that game is so bittersweet. Because you get there and you're like, gosh, this is awesome. Like, when I had, I'll just, if you've seen the cover art, you know that dinosaurs are in the game. Oh, there's a there's a T-Rex on the cover of the game. Uh, but when you when you get dinosaurs, it's a truly, like, little kid moment. Uh, yes. When when you get some of the most recognizable and and the 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 ones that you love that you always played with when you were a kid, it's truly special. But then there's that part of you that know this 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 has to end. I thought it was fascinating getting the in between dinosaurs, like the 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 life forms that are like like very clearly like hey small like low level frogs and lizards or you know whatever those kind of life forms were. And I started seeing them become dinosaurs. I'm like, oh, this motherfucker's getting scales on his back. He's going to become a stegosaurus. Yeah. And then when you know that they're about to go, like when you know that you're about to see your dinosaurs go away, it is terrifying. It, uh, it, like, it hurts a little bit because that's something that you worked so hard for. But if you don't let those dinosaurs go, like, you're never going to see everything else, right? The, everything that comes after. Yeah. And I got dinosaurs and my planet was, or my world was awesome. And, and your cube ex- expands as you go along. And I've got a big ass cube at this point, And I'm like, this is incredible. And I've got dinosaurs roaming and they're eating each other. And they're, you know, that it's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. But then I know. And that's for this to then become what I need it to become. I, I have to, I have to start slowly changing the world and I have to slowly make that world what it's, what the next step is and I know that doing so is going to kill off my dinosaurs but that's what this game does such a good job of is, is resetting it's like don't get too attached because it's about evolving and 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 the tutorial up front is as talkative and as in depth as it is it can't teach you those things like making those mistakes are part of what makes the game so awesome and I, I still fully believe if you went and bought this game right now you would make those same mistakes too that's the Harvest Moon-ish thing about it, that trial and error of like, oh, I got this, let me see what I can do with it, and then you destroy it, and you're like, oh, shit, how do I get it back? Now, so this game is thirty nine ninety nine. came out on PC, came out on uh, PS4. It's out now, you can go buy it. Uh, I, I just want to end with this. I don't I don't want this to be, it's not a pyramid scheme. Um, it's, it's, it's not a sales pitch. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, we want people to buy games that they're interested in. Um, if you're interested in this style of game, absolutely support this game because not only is it awesome and it's fun and it's quirky um but nis in my opinion is taking a big uh a big jump a uh, leap of faith with this game because it's not going to appeal to very many people not only did they make a, a a digital copy they released a physical version you know there's there's money in this game and 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 i don't know how much it's going to take for them to make it back but if you're even remotely interested in games like this you should try it because there's nothing else Exactly like this. Yeah. I think it's cool to see that they're willing to invest in gamers who want to play this kind of game. Yeah. It's it's very refreshing to see a fully-fledged, like, 
developed. It's not. It's not like an app. It's not. It's a full blown game. And they say we know people want, like you know they know that like guys like me and Ryan want to play this. They know that gamers out there want want games like this. And instead of tailoring it to be so widely accessible and maybe you know maybe it could have been a lot simpler or maybe it could have been a lot more goal oriented or maybe it could have been a lot more like Minecraft like they made the game exactly how they wanted to and it's great because of it yeah it's a, uh, it's an evolution simulator yeah yeah if i found 100 gamers and said do you want to play an evolution simulator they probably would be like no but when you find that one who's like hell yes yeah like they made the game for that person and yeah. that's truly unique, and and I know you can go read a hundred reviews, and I've read the reviews. I know I know what they say, and it's a very mixed bag. Um, it is more on the positive than the negative, but it's still it's 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 very mixed. You know, you can find a hundred, you can find a fifty for this game, but we don't do number scores. And and I think even my opinion of it and your opinion of it are different. Um, yeah, for sure. But and and I also think that our opinion of it is skewed because we like games like this, right? And I know that we have listeners that don't like games like this and it's not for you guys right but the 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 the, those of us out there who are into this kind of game like if you dumped hours into stardew valley if you dumped hours into harvest moon if you've dumped hours into minecraft if you you know popped on no man's sky at full price and loved it like this is a game that fits into that kind of you know for niche gamers who really love simulations and really love games that aren't just glorified tag you know like call of duty it's just tag this is this is a different kind of game it's um i don't know and it's very needed because it it's refreshing it's very refreshing mm-hmm. it's it's somebody who had the support behind them to make a game that they wanted to make and it shows and and for better or worse no man's sky was the same thing they made a game that they wanted to make um and it is about exploring and discovery and and uh look after the conversation we've had here if you're interested and for some reason you think you need to see this game reach out to us and i will record a video if you feel like it's necessary but i would rather you go in blind because this game is um part of what makes it so neat is that you don't know what's coming yeah, and I, I think I think a video on this game really is an injustice to the game. Yeah, I don't know a good way to show it off without ruining that surprise because uh, you and I talked as we were playing it. Like, there's those little boy moments where you're like, "Oh my god, have you had this yet?" Yeah. Um. And but then there's also that point of we're talking about it, it almost ruins the experience. Yeah, and we talked about it a lot in the beginning, and then we quit, and then we didn't yeah. really talk about it until we both had made it a lot further in the game, and. It's just it's truly unique, and if you like those kind of games, you know if you identify with the kind of games, especially that I play, because I play a lot of stuff that maybe doesn't appeal to the masses. Um, check it out. You can find it anywhere. It's it's not it's readily available. GameStop, Target, Best Buy, Walmart, Amazon, wherever you buy your stuff. Yeah. Um, speaking of, I don't know if I've ever recommended this game to you. I played it like I, back when we first started this podcast, so like three or four years ago. Um, there's this game called Roos. It was on PC for a long time. I think they put it on PS4. Uh, it's perfect for you. Um, R-E-U-S. It's a world-building RTS um, where you have, like, sections of the world that are controlled by these kind of, like, demigods, and you help or hinder a society in these different sections of the world based on how you're controlling it. Um, it's another game kind of like this that that I think you should play, and if anybody out there has played Birthdays or has played it, like if you've played Roos, I think you'd like Birthdays, and I think if you've played Birthdays, you'd like Roos. So, yeah, um, I don't think you've ever and, talked about it before. Yeah, I, I think I got it back in like 2013, like right when we first started the podcast. But uh, another game very similar to this that if you've played it, I think mm-hmm. Birthdays is for you if you if you like that style of game. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Um. To. A weird story, in my opinion. Yeah, this one's odd. And maybe it's just odd because I didn't see it coming. Um, but IO Interactive is being put up for sale by Square Enix. Um, and I guess the reason I didn't see it coming is because the last Hitman has been wildly successful. Yeah. The episodic thing that everyone, you know, said this is a terrible idea. Well, it turned out not to be a terrible idea. It kept people, it kept that game relevant for a year straight. Yeah. And... You know, we we haven't played it. I've I've talked about before. While I'm I'm really interested in that game, but mostly, 
you know, it's because I hear so many people say such good things about it. And it, this is this is just odd to me. And th- this is almost a fire sale. You know, they're they're not only getting out of this IO Interactive game; they want out now. Uh, so much so that they're willing to take a loss on everything that they've started for season two of Hitman. Yeah, which results I, in a huge loss. Uh, the only thing I can think that has happened here is that they have invested so much money into the 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 promise of success for for Hitman and for games like that. Which I think Hitman's the only thing they've released that's worth any note in the last couple of years. Um, that that was that I would view as a success, but maybe they sank so much money into that in development that they cannot sustain it and they if they have to get rid of it I don't know I don't either um and it it sucks for IO because IO used to be IDOS back in the day mhm so that's that's um, where Square Enix acquired them was in their purchase of IDOS right and that's that used to be like where Tomb Raider was was mm-hmm. IDOS and uh, and Hitman was always so. It sucks to think that if nobody picks up IO, that we could potentially lose Hitman for a little while. Um, I don't think it's an IP that would ever go away permanently. Uh, but on the success of the episodic Hitman stuff, it's odd to think that that's that like a successful game is is something that this company will shut down on. So here's where it gets a little messy. And so what's for sale is is. IO Interactive, where it gets a little messy, is that Square Enix owns Hitman. And so it, I don't know. I don't know if it moves with huh. it. I don't know if you're buying the studio and what they're working on. I don't know if you're getting just the studio. I don't well, know. you'd wh- have to, because there's nothing to sell otherwise other than the employment contracts. Right. The you know, And it's weird. They just opened a new studio. They just rebranded. Um, Square is saying this is a $42 million loss in order to close the studio. Um, and, you know, last year was the, they were 20% up on software sales. So, you know, I don't know. They, they helped with the Final Fantasy. They did the Tomb Raider report to PS4. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that they were involved in, and, and I don't know. I, this, this was out of left field for me. I did not see this coming because I thought it was hugely popular. They also worked on Mini Ninjas back in the day for PS3, which is a game I loved. Yeah, you uh, really love that game yeah. too much. Yeah, they've they've done some neat stuff, so it's sad to see. I hope someone does pick them up. Square says they're shopping them around, but they don't know that anyone will be interested. Um, that's kind of sad to me. So they sent a tweet out saying they're still hard at work and they're making games and that's what they're focused on. But, I mean, what else would they say? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we saw the same thing out of THQ a few years ago. The, they, THQ was responsible for the WWE wrestling series and Saints Row and all that stuff. And Darksiders, they got sold. They got picked up. THQ they got Nordic. Parted. Yeah, they got, they got parted out and they're doing, you know, those, those, those teams are doing fine now as parts of parts of other companies. So I think maybe more than anything, this may be just Square Enix saying, Hey, we can't sustain this, this studio anymore, no matter how successful it is. What about IO Interactive Nordic? I don't, I don't see it. I'm so, if we if we want to get into hypotheticals, I don't see IO staying as IO, but I can see IO getting picked up by like EA and getting merged in with like BioWare, yeah, or something like that. You know, I I, I can see that happening. Yeah, I, and, and I don't know, you know, I don't. They're um, they're Danish. I don't know what's over there. I don't know what what other people have in that area. I don't know, you know, I don't know what makes yeah. sense from a business. It would. These people obviously are capable of making uh, well put together games, though, and it would be sad to see the industry not find a place for them. I think. Uh, I think a company like Rockstar would be good to absorb it, mm-hmm. and because uh, Hitman is is very like needs that Rockstar treatment, um, and it's got that manhunt vibe already. Like it, like Hitman as it stands. If uh, even if Rockstar just bought IO to get any IPs that come with it. Uh, and not that I think that they need it, um, but I think that that would be a good fit. It would also be cool because I would just move their headquarters to Copenhagen. Right. And Rockstar Copenhagen would be pretty cool. 
Yeah. That would be a neat. Oh, dude, that would be yeah, cool. That yeah. would be good. That would uh, be cool. Uh, next story. BioWare's new game has been delayed past March of 2018, which is not ultra specific. And and no one knows if it means it's delayed for a year or a month or a week. You know, it's it's not coming out next year is what they're basically saying in the fiscal year yep. of of this this uh, year that we're in now. Right. Um, which is weird because uh, initially that's not what they said. Initially it was going to be out. Um, it, it's so they're building a game which appears to be like the division or like destiny. They said it is a live experience and they are hinting at the online, the online, um, portion being the reason this game is delayed. The online living, breathing world that this game is going to have is, is why it's being delayed. But you can't help but wonder if it's being delayed because of, uh, the, the way mass effect shipped and, and that they can't, Bioware can't have another slip up. And EA, I do believe that EA took the brunt of, of the, the critics, you know, of the of the way they felt about Mass Effect. I don't, I don't think that Bioware. I think they came out pretty okay in this, mm-hmm. because people blamed EA for rushing the game out. Yeah. No matter what happened, I don't. I mean, I, you and I don't know, but you know, I, I think EA was the bad guy in this, and I think that's okay. But I think. It, Bioware and I think EA can't afford to do that again. Yeah, I think I think that's nail on the head. They have to, they have to make sure that when this thing ships, there's not so much as a spotty piece of dialogue, right? Because now they're under the microscope. Not that Andromeda is a bad game, but to launch a game that you know, and EA EA played the role of the bad guy because that's what a publisher does. That's what they're there for. They're there to make their developer continue to look good and to, you know, make sure that that project keeps going. But they're not going to do it twice. Right. You It'll know? be interesting to see what this is. Um, EA's CEO, Andrew Wilson, said back in January that it was an action adventure, not an RPG title, although he said the game would still have plenty of RPG-style character progression. Um, but, it, but it will be... It'll be... Re- just wound around this live service, whatever that means. Hmm. So I think a division style game, um, maybe more so than a destiny style, even though they're similar. Yeah. Do you remember back when PS4 was launching, there was that title and I, I don't, I can't remember who the developer Agents? was on it. The one where you create your own superhero. Is um, that the one? I don't Agents was like a weird thing like that. That was a rock star game. Gotcha. That's not the one I'm thinking of. I'm thinking oh. of one. It was it was like the character development was it was RPG, but it was that you were a superhero. So if you took certain stats, your power morphed into like like you could become a geomancer, or you could teleport, or you could become invisible. Um, but it was a it was they they had kind of plugged it like a like an open online world with infamous style, like bad guys that would just be littered around. And when you'd run into other characters, like that's where the interactions happened. But it was all about developing your superhero by having these RPG stat upgrades. Um, I don't know. All I, don't, I can think about is DCU online. I know that's not what you're talking about. No, 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 no. I'll have to find some video of it. We got pretty pumped about it, or at least me and Dan did and never heard about it. But I don't think I don't think it was Bioware, but I'd be curious if that's a title like similar to the title that they're working on. Could have been. Um Agent was that weird and, and no one knows what's ever gonna happen here, but you know, Rockstar had signed an exclusive one game deal with, with Sony. And that game was Agent and it just never came out. I don't know if I remember Agents. I'm looking at it real quick. I think it's just Agent. No S. Agent? Agent. Stealth Action Video Game by Rockstar North. July 2017, Sony announced that Rockstar Games was working on a new exclusive for the PlayStation 3. Uh, the game was set during the Cold War and would take players into the world of counterintelligence espionage and political assassinations but it was some sort of weird um always connected live breathing world too i think was the whole idea behind it but that never that never came out but yeah i don't i don't know the one you're talking about was there a trailer or anything for agent i believe so there was at least a teaser i think maybe i remember seeing it i feel like back in the day i don't know I think Bioware 100 percent can rebound. I hope they have a good idea they're working on, um, because 
they make awesome games and I would love to see them get another shot at making Mass Effect the way that they want to. And I think the success of this next game is going to have a lot to do with, with where they go from here. Anything to add before we move on? Nope, that's fine. All right. Um, Alan Wake is going to be removed from the stores. Um, obviously, I'm talking about digital. Um, it, it appears the game has some expiring licensing issues. All of the music from the game is actually expiring, and they're not able to strike a new deal. As of yet, they are working on it. Uh, the cool thing is that they have this this, this game on sale right now. Uh, it's very cheap, especially if you buy it on... Um, it's three dollars right now. I think that's the PC version. Yeah, Steam ninety percent off. Um, here's the kicker, though. This might be the most timely story that we've ever discussed because this ends Monday morning. Wow. So it's on sale now when we're recording this, but but Monday morning at like ten a.m. I think uh, Pacific time, this goes off. Um, so you want to, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, cool, I'll get that later. There's no later. You have to go get it right now. Or you might have already missed it. Sorry. Um, obviously, the physical version still out there, and that is backwards compatible on an Xbox One. So you can still go to GameStop and scoop it up for probably five bucks. Of course, knowing GameStop, the price will shoot up now that they know you can't get it somewhere else. Um, but yeah, Alan Wake, a great game. If you didn't play it, you should play it. And maybe your last chance to get it. You know, This is something people don't think about, it, but as those especially the music licenses as they expire sometimes those games have to stop being sold digitally mm-hmm. so this is a good spot for uh we got a question in this week from uh, Garrett Wade and as we've talked about a couple of games here that we like the series or we didn't like the series or games that people might like i think this kind of fits um Garrett wrote in on Twitter just like you can uh at game underscore stitch and said what game or franchise loved by most could you not get into and he says for him it was dark souls but he's absolutely in love with neo um did you have anything like that where the series didn't turn you on um but everybody else kind of loved it it's really easy for me is the last of us and gotcha just I, I i tried to play this 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 single player and i got hung up and i quit and of course i enjoyed the multiplayer but then when i tried to get back in the single player again playing this time on on baby mode thinking that would make it better i still just could not get into it and i know it's amazing and i know that everyone you know had a a life-changing experience with this game i've never been able to get into it that which drives me crazy i think if you ever finished it it would really like it's a i feel like everybody has to play that game um for me it's rocket league I think that's pretty obvious. I've talked about it a million times. You guys can't stop playing it, and I can't find myself in any way interested. Um, it's frustrating, and I'm not good at it, and I just don't like it. Yeah, there's Rocket League is one of those things. Like I can't even understand somebody not liking it at this point. Yeah, because I'm too it, invested. Yeah, and when someone well, I mean, gets in, like I went through all those stages that you're in, where you're like, I'm not good at it. Everybody's better than me. I don't get it. I don't understand what how to how to be better. But then, like I don't know, there's something when you reach a certain point. And actually, it's it's funny you picked that because I talked about this with Garrett when we were chatting one night uh, on on the PlayStation. He's never been able to get in the Rocket League like that. Yeah, you know, he's tried it and and doesn't 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 grab him like that. And everybody's better. And there's something I don't know. There's just something that happened and. So I played Rocket League the other day for probably about four hours with no friends, and I don't ever play Rocket League without friends usually. I very rarely, you know, I'll do a solo game here or there, but I don't play, and I was playing with other people. You know, I was playing uh, 3v3, so with two strangers and then against three strangers, and it was toxic, it was not fun, it was frustrating. You know, I, I believe part of what has kept me going on Rocket League so long is that I have a core group of people that I play with. Yeah. And it's almost just like you go to work. Like you just, you play Rocket League. You get on, you talk about your days. We all joke, we laugh, we make fun of each other, and we play Rocket League. Yeah. And it, it has become very special to me, but I can understand. I can understand, I guess, if, if I didn't have those people, how it might be different. But I have those people, so I haven't really experienced it. But that I did not enjoy my four hours the other day. Yeah. Man, even with you guys, I can't find myself invested in rocket league at all yeah. and uh but i feel like i get that same vibe playing deformers like I, f- I feel like i get that same we get on we don't really like the game's fun but it's not really about the game 
I enjoyed the former zone. I'm just I'm for some reason bad at that game. I can't figure out why you're bad at it. Yeah, I'm, a... I'm not good at it. Like when we played the other night, uh, we we all jumped on and and we were able to hook up with Garrett and play for the first time. He like played the game one time and beat me just as much as I beat him. Like I'm just not yeah. good at that game for some reason. I'm uncomfortably good at it. Yeah, I inexplicably. I don't um, get it. Like, I don't get how I'm not good at it. Like, I do what I feel like the same thing the other person's doing, but I'm the one that gets hit every time. Yeah. I just don't understand why I'm bad at it. But I enjoy that game. I have a great time with that game. And I want to play more of it. I really like Deformers. Yeah, Deformers is a great game. I feel like um, if I weren't good at that game, I wouldn't have a good time at it, though. Like, I wouldn't enjoy playing it. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't bother me on that for some reason. I just I just can't figure out why I'm not good at it. Like, yeah. I'm fine with the fact that I'm not, but I can't figure... Here's how bad I am at that game. Whenever you left the other night, me and Garrett jumped into 1v1 matches. Right. And the, my first thought was, I hope I can make this competitive. <laughs> I'm not worried about winning because I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. Like, I just wanted it to not like not be a blowout. So we jump into first match, and he I died like seven times, and I killed him once. And I'm like, this is... That's crazy, He's about to dude. jump off here. Uh, but I calm myself. And I won the next one, and I think we swapped back and forth after that each match. Um, but I had to really kind of change how I played, especially for 1v1. But, like, I struggle to even be competitive in that game for some reason. That's crazy. Yeah. It, uh, it comes so easy to me that it is almost boring. Yeah, not to me. Like, we, we have not, and I don't mean that in a way that, like, I'm, like, I've never not been first place when we played. Right. Like, in, you know, like, in a world of deformers players, I've never not been first place. And I, it scares me that I'm that good because I know one day I'm going to come, come rolling down off the top of that mountain. Cause I don't play it enough to stay good. Well, that's a mistake you're making is you, if you would stay with it, you could be super, super good. Right. But I don't think uh deformers competitive plays are going to be like MLG stuff. So it could be, it's could be pointless. bro. Could be it's pointless. Oh, that's a great question. I enjoy that. If you have a question for us, like you said, at, at game underscore stitch or podcast at gamestitch.com. Yeah, hashtag GSPQ. Uh, next story, Nintendo deta- details its plans for E3. They sent out an adorable little infograph. Info, what do they call those? Infographs? Is that what they infograph. are? Infograph, yeah. Yeah. That's fine. It's got Mario on it. Uh, there's a reason it has Mario on it. They won't be uh, They won't be doing a traditional E3 presentation, but they will be at E3, and they will be showing off Mario Odyssey. Yeah. Which I think everybody is excited about. Uh, directly after showing off Mario Odyssey, they're going to do a uh, Treehouse Live at E3. Uh, they're going to be showing off Switch games. They're going to be showing off 3DS games. They'll probably be showing off that new fancy-ass 2DS. It looks super good. Um, and then they also have a tournament running for Splatoon and for ARMS. And those are running June 13th and 14th. And if you're going to E3, uh, the way that I understand this is you could try to go be a part of those tournaments. That's cool. So, you know, it's kind of like they did last year with the Zelda booth. I'm sure they're going to go all out with Mario Odyssey this year. Are there uh, any games that any games or game types you hope to see out of them? I don't know what to do with Nintendo anymore. I just Man. want them to do whatever they want to do because that works. I'm jonesing so hard for a new Animal Crossing. I just want to see some third party support. Yeah, I mean, it's I assume it's coming, but. I just want a new Animal Crossing, and I don't want it at the end of a cycle. Like, I'm tired of getting it when people aren't playing it anymore. Like, I want it now. I want it up front. I want it to tie into the mobile Animal Crossing they're working on. Um, I like what Nintendo's doing with the coins, and I earn the coins playing Mitomo, and I earn the coins playing Super Mario Run, Mario Run, forever. And those coins can then be used to unlock stuff as I'm playing the Switch. Like, I love the way everything's working. They're doing yeah. achievements the way that we talked about them in that they're not achievements as much as they're like points that you earn. You can use those points for anything you play. You can even use them for physical stuff. Like they're doing it all right when it comes to that. But like I need some of those games. Like I want a Pikmin game. I know they have Hey Pikmin coming out for 3DS. I want a Pikmin for Switch. Yeah. Love Pikmin. I want I want a new one. I know they have one on the Wii U that nobody played, but I did. And now I'm ready yeah. for a new one. So I just want Nintendo to be Nintendo, but I don't want them to take forever Yeah, to do it. Now, I don't expect any I don't expect any more than one first-party announcement, if even that. I really don't expect any from them. Yeah. 
So you've so we got a question in on Facebook from uh, from Thomas Barfield, a uh, patron and friend of the show. Um, he says, in which what, which in what ways could the switch most be improved? Um, I think you pretty much answered that on your side. Um, so I I need third party titles. Um, I expect to see Battlefield, Call of Duty. I need a wrestling game that I can take with me everywhere. I need a racing game, not Mario Kart. I would love to see uh, Project Cars or some kind of third... You know, like Project Cars was supposed to come out on Wii U and never did. So I think it would be cool to see Project Cars 2, which I think is one of our next stories coming up. I would love to see that on Switch. I think the Switch could handle it. It wouldn't be the prettiest game, but like I need... I need more than first party Nintendo. So so where you're looking for a lot of these first party Nintendo titles to come out and hit, I need more than that. I need things that feel familiar from my other consoles. They don't have to be repeats. Like I don't need Resident Evil seven to come out, but I would love to see, you know, the next Battlefront or the next Resident Evil or Overwatch or something that takes advantage of the mobility of the Switch. Mm-hmm. And really demonstrates how much of a modern console it is. Because right now what we have is Nintendo first party and Nintendo sponsored indie games. And we don't have anything that's cross platform. Uh, Minecraft just came out. So for 30 bucks, I think I'm going to buy Minecraft and see how that susses up against everything else. But there's nothing to say like, um, like for an example, like, uh, like if Grand Theft Auto five were on switch, there's nothing like that to pop it on the Switch and say, hey, this proves that Nintendo Switch is just as good as everything else, and it has these unique features that everybody should take advantage of. So I need, I really want them to come out and do something like that, but I know they won't. I know they won't come out and be like, hey, you like WWE 2K17? Uh, Great, because 18's coming out. Hey, you like NBA? Here's the exact version that's going to be on PS4 and, and Xbox One. It's going to be on the Switch also. You like this here it is on the switch some of that i understand though and that i don't know that they can give you the same game i think they i think a lot of games they can and, and, and i think skyrim's proof of that yeah you know but skyrim might be proof of that they can give you the same game they gave you on ps3 but i don't know if they can give you uncharted 4 on the switch and that's okay it doesn't need to but i think some i think <sighs> i think they're shying away because i'm not sure if they know if, they, if I don't know if they know yet if they can give you that experience. But let's be clear. Uncharted 4 is the same experience as Uncharted 3. It's it, just graphically improved. Right. But if so there's the, a better way to play it, how many people are going to play it on the Switch? I, well, I think that that's, that's a unique place for the Switch is if it's... And this this gets we talked about this last week with modular PC components coming into video the video game realm. The idea that any any game has graphic settings, right? Even if it's on a console, now they like games have graphic settings. Different configurations of systems take advantage of those graphics in a different way. The Switch doesn't have to come out and look the best because the Switch gives you a very unique experience in that you can play it mobile as a tablet. You can then immediately go into the TV with it. You you have such a different experience that graphically it doesn't have to match everything else because you're not going to be playing Skyrim on your Switch going man this looks like shit you're going to be playing going I am playing Skyrim at the movie theater before this movie starts on something that fits in my backpack right and that is incredible that is so cool. it doesn't have to look like Skyrim HD remake thing that just came out it just needs to look like Skyrim <laughs> Uncharted 4 on the Switch wouldn't have to look like Uncharted 4 on the PS4 it would just have to play as well. And if it looked somewhere between PS3 and PS4 graphics, you would still be like, I'm playing Uncharted 4 at work right now. How fucking cool is that? Switches you know? are becoming way more available. So, you know, as you see these numbers tick up for people who have these consoles, maybe more third parties come forward and do just that. But I think a lot of it has to do with there are 2 million units in the wild, and that's as good as you're going to get, you, even if everyone buys it. So I think... As those units start to tick up, I think you'll see more of those. Well, hit me with a question again. Uh, in what way could the Switch be most improved? Now, I don't know if he means the console or if he means the marketing or the games or whatever. So you went with the games. I'm going to stick with the system because I don't know what he meant either, and that way we cover all bases. Yeah. Uh, so there are two things I would change about the Switch. Uh, n- neither of these are deal breakers. One of these is super fucking annoying. Uh, so the first... 
thing that's not going to change that I would change is that the charge port is on the bottom of the system. Mm. Um, if you are in kickstand mode, you can't plug your system in. I would change that. Yeah. That's not going to change. It's fine. It doesn't break anything. Now, the second thing that I would change, this is the one that frustrates me to no end. The rails for the Joy-Con are fucking hard for me to get out. I don't That's know. That's weird. I don't know yeah. if I do it wrong. I don't know what it is. It's just when the, the top piece is in. I can't hit the button, slide it, and make sure that that strap thing doesn't click down. Are you talking about the shoulder the rails? The shoulder rails. The shoulder button extensions? Yeah. I have the, they're hard to get out. Like, the, I have to pull way harder on those than I do anything else. Hmm. Everything else just slides right out, you know, when you put it in there. Like in the Joy-Con grip, it slides right out, no problem. Those little shoulders are hard for me to get out. I can't hit the button because when I do, the fucking little lock thing goes down on its own, and I'm trying to hold that back. It's a pain in the ass, so I would change that. Uh, I have a strategy for that, which is I hold the button. So I have the Joy-Con here. I press the button in, and I just push up from the bottom of the strap. Let's push up from the bottom. I've done that before, off. and it shoots the fucker off into the floor. Yeah, that's uh, how I do it. Yeah, it goes flying. I bet I would like a more elegant way to get that off. Uh, but the Switch is a damn good system. Those are very nitpicky things. Maybe not the. I mean, the power cord at the bottom is. I don't know why no one thought of that. Well, that's because uh, how it, that's how it seats into the dock. Yeah, I get that, but they could have d- easily put Just another, put another port. one somewhere yeah, else. Yeah. yeah, I understand why that one has to exist. Um, yeah, but that, that's no excuse for not having one, like, directly into the back so right. that you can just plug it in while it's in kickstand mode or off the top. Yeah, I get that. The Switch is, to me, it is one of the best purchases I've made. I've had no regrets of it since the first day. Um, so it's very hard for me. Like, for me, the nitpick is in the games. Yeah. It's, it's really in just making, like, the games would make it, the doubt go away. It's hard, like, as a Switch owner, I love telling people about it, and it's really fun. Like, like when we're, like, when I go to wrestling practice every week, it's really easy to pop that thing on the mat, toss somebody a controller, and lay down and play Tetris, mm-hmm. or lay down and play Mario Kart, and people get it. But if, if it weren't for that, like, that thing doesn't, like, nobody, nobody believes in it. Mm-hmm. And I think if you could show that, like, Battlefield 1 ran the same on the Switch as, as everywhere else, that would really, that would really put it over the top. Great question, Thomas. Um, great system. Go buy one if you don't have one. And I, I know you don't because we've been talking about it this week. Right. But go get yourself one. Yeah, great question. Uh, they Treat are available. Yourself. Yeah. Uh, last story, Project Cars 2 is getting a limited day one edition, and we're going to tell you what you get out of that. Uh, you're going to get a, uh, in a press release, slightly mad, the developer said uh, for pre-order, you'll get a Nissan Group A R32 Skyline GTR. Woo, baby. An N280ZX GTX race car. Uh, from Honda, you're getting a 280ZX GTX and a 2 and 4 concept car. The pack also comes with unique paint jobs for each. Uh, you can get this two ways. You can pre-order it and guarantee you get it, or you can hope to find a day one edition in a store in the wild, and all day one editions will be packed with it. I think that's pretty safe to say you'll get that day one edition. More than likely. But if you if you don't want to roll the dice, pop a pre-order down on this. If you do, yeah. don't care about those cars. Don't worry about it. Um, i tell you what. Project Cars is a game I could not, I couldn't pass on the first time. Yeah, I love it on PC. I hated the console release. If if they didn't do something drastically different, I won't even consider this one. Yeah, the problem with Project Cars on the console was you have to have a steering wheel with it because it is unplayable with a controller. And the PC version, you could manipulate the game controls to make a controller work, and it was fun. It was like playing Gran Turismo. Well, my problem uh, with it was console that version it's, was unplayable. It's it's not a uh, let me let me think of how I want to say it. It's not a game. Yeah, it's a simulation. It, it's it, it's not a simulation in the way that console people use that word. Yeah, uh, there are no unlockables. There are no goals. There are just tracks and cars. Yep. You get in a track, or you get in a car. You go to a track. Like, that's it. There, there is nothing else. Like, you don't you don't fix the cars up. You don't... They're just all there. They're all playable from the start. All the tracks are unlocked from the start. You just drive. Yeah. And that's fine. That's not the experience I was looking for. I like, I like to play a game. Yeah. And I wanted it to be a little more gamey. So, unless I know that that's been done, as beautiful as this game is, by far the best looking driving game I've touched. Um, even as great as Gran Turismo is, Project Cars was down to the detail um, on everything, but it's not a game there. Not fun. 
Yeah, and that's crazy because on PC, it is a game about like how can you tweak this car to make it run better on this track. Right. And on console, it wasn't. Project Cars 2 is expected to hit um, late 2017. PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. That's all the news. That's it. That's cool. It's a news section. Now it's time for our newest revived section. Not a section, really. It's a segment. segment. Yeah, our newest, our Phoenix segment. Gone but not forgotten. Where we reach back in our gaming past, we pull off a title for you, we dust it off, we shove it right in your face. This week it's my turn, and I've got a, I've got a gem, a real dandy, a doozy, a doozy, a dollop of Daisy. Uh, my game for Gone but Not Forgotten is Spot Goes to Hollywood. I don't even know this. Oh, the Seven Up game. It's the it's, so it's the sequel to Cool Spot. Yeah. Uh, I had a lot of fun with Cool Spot, but I had more fun with Spot Goes to Hollywood. It came out on several different systems, uh, initially coming out for the... Uh, Sega Genesis. The Genesis. Uh, yeah. It was also on the Saturn and the PlayStation. The PlayStation is where I played this game. Came out a year later on the PlayStation. <sighs> so something. So you're the 7-Up Dot, if you're not familiar with Spot. You're the, the 7-Up Spot, the period. <laughs> um, and you got arms and you got legs and you wear sunglasses. And sunglasses yeah and it's just a platformer it's an old school platformer it feels like it um, but but Spot Goes to Hollywood was a game I dumped way too much time in and, and, and I got a soft spot for it even to this day um, I don't go back and play it I do still own it I don't go back and play it because it probably sucks real hard yeah um, it was in that era of like all the graphics were generated in a 3D program on the computer and then stripped down to, like, seven-frame GIFs and then run through the game engine. Mm-hmm. I did it was watch, a really cool game. Preparing for this game, but I forgot, and I did watch a video on it because I wondered how it held up. I, it looks like a blast still, but I'm sure it's not. I'm going to check it out. So, uh, Cool Spot, like I said, I did play Cool Spot on the Genesis, uh, but I found my home uh, when it comes to the Spot games on Spot Goes to Hollywood. I think you're going to be pretty pleasantly happy with what you see here as you get this video loaded up. And you guys should, at home, <laughs> you should check out Spot Goes to Hollywood on YouTube and just watch a little bit. Yeah, man. It still looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, it does. It's that crazy, like, isometric 3D where mm-hmm. you can't tell where you're at. Yeah. But everything is, it's got that, like, Donkey Kong Country look because yeah. it's in that area. It era. really does feel like that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So Spot Goes to Hollywood. Uh, check it out. Like I said, it initially came out for the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive in uh, 1995. It then came out in 97 on Saturn and 96 on PlayStation. So I played the PlayStation version. I might even own the Sega version, the Saturn version, but I played it on PlayStation. It's crazy to me that 7-Up had a video game. Dude, Yo Noid, 7-Up, like it was out there. Marketing was alive and well yeah and I and I miss it uh, that's my Gone But Not Forgotten check it out if you have a Gone But Not Forgotten for us make sure you write in podcast at gamestitch.com or hit us up on game stitch or at game underscore stitch on Twitter using the hashtag GBNF just like our friend Dustin Reese did he wrote in and said my Gone But Not Forgotten is Fear Effect for PS1 it was developed by Kronos Eidos Interactive Chronos Digital Interactive and published by Ida. Sorry, I had a stroke. Um, <laughs> he didn't say any of that. He just said that correctly, and I read it wrong. Uh, it was one of the few games from my childhood that I remember playing almost exclusively with cheat codes because it was really challenging, mm-hmm. possibly for the wrong reasons. Uh, it's a little reminiscent of early Resident Evil games as far as mm-hmm. the, control, con- the control scheme goes and even had an odd overall look due to the 3D models and 2D facial expression. I don't remember this game at all, but that sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's very... Uh, so it was in the era of Resident Evil. The controls are exactly that way. Um, but it was also like almost cel-shaded if you if you never played it. And it's all like quick-time events, basically. Um, for, for combat, it's really like a story game. Um, but it's pre-rendered backgrounds with slightly real-time lighting effects. It looks like it's on the Resident Evil 1 engine, though. Um, I don't 
No, I remember the game for the cutscene of the girl being naked in the shower, but I don't know if that's because I played it or if that's because I saw it in like Game Informer or something when I was a kid. Um, but I do vaguely remember this game. It's got this like kind of paranormal ghost in the effect or ghost in the fe- ghost in the shell um, mm. type story going on. Um, but pretty good. Like does, not a terrible game. It doesn't hold up. Dustin but if goes they on it, to say it probably isn't worth playing nowadays. Oh no, not at all. I doubt it holds up. I will say that you should watch the cutscenes on YouTube. Most will probably find it more funny than anything else because of the aforementioned aesthetic and eccentric voice acting. Yeah. So that's that's his his gone but not forgotten, and we thank him for that. But he continues this email, and you and I have done a little detective work here. Yeah. So he goes on to say, my original Gone But Not Forgotten was a PC game from way back in the day that was called I Was a Teenage Mutant. The problem is I literally can't find anything about this online. It's as if it never existed, and I'm about 95% sure that was the title. So you and well, I did some... you're 5% wrong, sir. <laughs> you and I did some... Well, we don't know. That's what you're going to have to let us know, Dustin. We did some legwork here. We did some detective work. We got online. We went to the Googles. We spent some time on YouTube, and we we went all through the online internets, the interweb. And what we think you're talking about, you have it, you have it ready, Matt. I've got it. Okay. Yeah. So tell him what we think that you're talking about. There's a gem called "I Was an Atomic Mutant." Right. That's after digging, after after watching videos, reading. This is the game that we think you're talking about. I was an right. atomic mutant, not a teenage mutant. Very similar, and if you search for Teenage Mutant, good luck finding anything but Ninja Turtle reference. Right, even with a Boolean and taking out the words uh, mutant, or even taking out the words Ninja and Turtle, you still get Ninja Turtles. Right. Uh, But this is very very much the same description that you give of a game, just totally, well, not totally, but just a different title. Yeah, so hopefully, and and let us know either on Twitter or, or through email, just like you did here, if that's the game. If it's not, we'll continue the detective work. Yeah, we'll keep finding out for but you. But we think that this is the one you're talking about. And, and if you are, this game looks nuts. <laughs> yeah, this in game a bad is, way. This game is wacky for all the wrong reasons, but it's almost it's almost like, like B-horror in a game, which makes it almost look kind of like it would have a cult following. So that's why I think it could be this game. Yeah. I'm excited to hear from you. And if you have a gone but not forgotten for us, like I said, hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag GBNF or email us podcast at gamestitch.com. We look forward to hearing from you, Dustin. I just want to quickly say our Patreon rewards went out last week. Uh, If you haven't already got those, those should be arriving for all of our supporters over there. Um, We'd love to see you uh, send some pictures with what we sent you. Uh, If not, that's cool too, but thank you for your support. Yeah, I hope you guys like that stuff. It's been a, it's been a girthy show. Yeah, it's been a long show. Real That's me- what happens when, when Dan's not here to kind of rein us in. Real meat and potatoes kind of show. Yeah. Every now and then you need just a, a big fat episode. Yeah. Dan really kind of keeps us on track, though. He doesn't let that two hours of nonsense happen at the beginning. That Amiibo discussion, he would have shot that down. Yeah. All the Switch talk, it's been too much for him. Yep. And uh, he sucks the life out of owning a Switch, and I mean that in the best way, uh, because so, he knows how bad we want him to get one. Yeah, so if you didn't like this episode, blame Dan. Yeah, it's really Dan's fault. Also, he had brunch while we didn't. Son of a bitch. So like, like, I don't like Eggs Benedict, yeah. too. So bastard. right off the bat, I, I've, I've spoken out against brunch before, but if it's, if it's no food or brunch, I'll take brunch. I love a good brunch, dude. I, I don't. I don't like brunch. Now, I'll tell you what I do let slide is the brunch burger because it's not really brunch. Right. That's just lunch. You're just having it early. Right, exactly. You just want a burger and you're fat, but it's too soon. It's fine. Yeah. If you want to follow us on the social medias, I am at Podcast Ryan. Matt is at Goddamn It Matt. Dan is at Shirtless Dan. Tell him that brunch is special when you're with your mom. Uh, just tell him that. For, and he won't know why you're saying it, but it'll be fun if you tell him that. <laughs> Uh, brunch is special when you're with your mom. Don't say anything else. Just brunch is special with your when you're with your mom. He'll under he won't understand, which will make it nice. Uh, if you we'll want to get it though, if you want to tweet all of us, we are at game underscore stitch. 
thanks thanks for being here everybody yeah thanks for just being a part of this thanks for listening to this big old fat episode it's a classic episode this is like when we were starting out classic it was just me and you trying to figure it out a real classic yeah a real classic also a barn burner special patreon shout out to our friends thomas barfield and garrett wade yeah thanks fellers if you want to support us at the shout out tier you can do so also i'm going to open this up to you guys we haven't talked about this. this is all off the cuff okay if you want to send us a specific shout out i'll read those oh, yeah. too yeah i mean that's what shout out tier is all about so even though we've just been shouting out you for being such awesome people, I'll let you get down to the nitty gritty. And if you want to shout something special out, if you want me to like, like send a negative message, you know, verbally to one of your friends or a positive to a loved one, I'll read whatever you send me as long as it's not, uh, as long as it's not totally against the things I believe in and that, yeah. I don't, you know, I can't, so I can't go with racial slurs on here, you know? So there are there are if you if you go look at the Patreon it does say that we reserve the right to not shout out or not read you know like if you want to do the the ad spot or something like that um, and just so you know it doesn't mean that like we're gonna take your money and not do it it means that like if you say something racially offensive or hateful like we reserve the right to not have to read that right if you want in, in the best interest of our business right so, if you want to like, be a sexist douchebag on your own time that's fine I can't read it. Right. We uh, won't stop you from supporting the show. We're just not going to read you, your crazy things. That and you and in fairness, if you have one for us and, and we find it's a little too risque, we'll we'll let you know so that you can either alter it or just send us something else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you if you want to shout out a loved one or if you want to say you suck for not playing Destiny with me or whatever, let us know because you're supporting us at that tier and we want to make it fun for you guys too. Yeah. Also, a uh, shout out for Mom's Happy Mother's Day again. Yeah. It's not Mother's Day, but... But happy one. Happy yeah. Monday. Well, it is Mother's Day. Yeah, but well, not when they're listening. Yeah, not when you're listening. So you're doing that thing where you, you, you're acting like they're listening on the day that the you're The timeline is crazy, dude. The timeline is bonkers. I can't get it, my head wrapped around it. Right. Well, because we're in the future right now. Right. Well, we're actually in the past. Well, we're in the past right now. Right. <laughs> so you're having trouble, too. Yeah, I don't know anymore, either. This has been episode 226 of the official Game Stitch Podcast. Leave us a rating over on iTunes. It helps out a whole lot. It helps other people find us. You guys have been doing that. We're slowly ticking up there, and we appreciate that. Uh, but it just continue to let people know to rate us over there. That seems to be the best way for new listeners to find the show. Yeah. Don't forget to join us on Discord. Uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber, don't forget to check there for your Discord rewards so you can get into the subscriber-only channel. Uh, don't forget that on May 25th, that is a Thursday evening, we're going to be doing Game Stitch Live. Uh, we did get a request if we could do it on the 29th, uh, which is Memorial Day. And being that that's Memorial Day, we're gonna have to go gnaw on that one. Uh, I think all of us have plans, unfortunately. Uh, but Game Stitch Live is available after the fact on youtube.com forward slash Game So if you, if you miss it and you can't participate, we, we definitely, we will miss having you there, but, uh, it's still available for you to, uh, to watch after the fact. And, uh, we hope you can make it to the next one. Um, we will have two giveaways on that show. Uh, we're going to do a video game and a trinket. And then let me, let me say this about game stitch live. Okay. If you have not already go back and, and watch episode one, it's on YouTube right now. You can find it. It's pretty easy to locate. Here's what I want to say. I can guarantee you episode two is going to be better. Yeah, because what we did with episode one was turn on the cameras, turn on the microphones, and then go for an hour. But what I need you to do as fans of the show and as supporters of us is watch the first episode so that you can see the growth. Because yeah. if you just jump in at episode two, you might think this is still not what I need it to be because it's new and we're learning what that show is. But if you watch episode one, I can guarantee you at the end you think this is better than right. episode and if one. You're if you're a new fan of this of this show, if you're just listening to the podcast and you've missed the first 200 and odd episodes and you're not sure where we came from, Game Stitch Live is a great great way for you to see a lot of how this podcast started off. Yeah. Um it's a brand new th- experience for both of us, for not only the the hosts but also for you guys. Um and Game Stitch Live is open to your suggestions. So if you watch that first episode and you think that we can improve in some way, send us a tweet, send us an email, let us know, because that show is for you guys. It's Patreon funded. The only way that Game Stitch Live happens is through the support of our patrons. Um, so big thanks to those guys. And because it's a show 
funded by you guys it's controlled by you guys if you want to see something specific you just let us know um and uh, also i think we're gonna get um some special content from thomas barfield in the form of a question i think he's he so he is subscribed to the patreon tier where he gets to contribute a question to the show uh for us to kind of discuss and dissect and and really go into so if you uh, if you want to influence the show um in in a very direct way there is a patreon tier for that and the idea behind the show is it's less less video game centric and more uh just topical about the things we want to talk about a chance for you guys to learn more about us and interact with us uh, but you will see that show morph into a form that is what you guys want it to be uh, so but, but listen to episode one because I think you'll see the progression in episode two um, and we'll go from there uh, but we do want to thank everyone who has supported uh, and make those things possible making dreams come true out there in, in ear land listener land ear land ear hole land yeah that yeah your your whole landia or maybe even yeah all right episode 226 thanks good night good night